I'm DeVry, this is Xander. I've been playing for like 20 years. Uh, sometime this spring was 20 years. Uh, I've been playing for about 16, 17 years, I've, uh, but it took like a five year break. We're just going to go over a little bit of my philosophy when I work with a pole and when I work with other pole people. Safety is first, slaughter is secondary, right? Like, we want to be the friendliest poles we can be so people don't yell at us when we bring poles out. Um, <laughs> like, as much as I like to, you know, put somebody on the ground every now and then, that's not conducive to a friendly ditch field and non-friendly ditch fields don't keep people around so we need to be conscientious about where we and how hard we swing our weapon um, the bonus to that is if you if you are really nice with your pole arm the rare opportunities that you get to put somebody on the ground people just laugh it off because it's not an everyday occurrence you're not hurting people so when you do end up you know putting somebody on their back they're like oh that was really awesome because you're really nice about it you're normally yeah um pole arms greatest weapon is generally its threat range and that threat range is going to give you the ability to control the field and do damage and threaten from that range um if you aren't actively using your pole to threaten people it's just a wall hanger at that point. There's no point to have it. You might as well use something else if you're not actively threatening people and keeping your eyes on your peripheries because that's where you're going to get attacked from most of the time is somebody's going to come at you off the angle. So you want to keep scanning and you want to keep your uh, tip moving and threatening people at all times. An unaware player is your prey. If you're fighting and you see somebody in your periphery that's not paying attention to you, that's a free kill. You should take it. Uh, be aware of your range because you might overextend and then miss. But generally, if you you know see somebody who's not paying attention, just like if you're using a bow, that's your first target. You know, teamwork makes the dream work. Poles are great uh, weapons. They are better weapons when paired with your friends. A lone pole person on the flank is not going to be nearly as good as a pole and a board on the flank pushing the flank or working in the middle uh, to split a line. Right, so. Sticking with a, a good boardman, like, I bet if Xander and I went out and one of us went board and one of us went pole, it'd be real hard to kill us because we'd work together. When I make, uh, we're going to go to a little bit more safety stuff. Uh, when I make a bamboo pole, I skin the whole thing with crosshatch strapping tape. That way, if it splinters, it's encased in tape and fiberglass, and it's not just going to fly off somewhere and hit somebody or poke somebody. I like to use thicker or denser than required courtesy padding. Like if you use the bare minimum pipe insulation, the cheap pipe insulation, mm -hmm. that'll be legal for about a day. And then once you, once you chop something on that courtesy padding, once you hit another pole hard with that courtesy padding, it's not gonna be padding anymore. It's just gonna split. Something that's really important, uh, if you're using bamboo, uh, here's an example of not, this is not a, this is a sword thickness blade because this is 602 kite spar in here. This is not bamboo or banshaw. All of my bamboo poles, bond made, they're three to three, three and a quarter. They're bigger than minimum foam because you need an inch of uncompressed foam over your core to be a legal weapon. So if you're out checking weapons and somebody's got a bamboo pole and they have a two and a half inch blade, that's illegal. Even if you can't feel the core, it's an illegal weapon. Yeah, you need thick inch, enough core, not legal. or a thick enough foam, rather. And then uh, when you're chopping, like if you're chopping from a murder strike, I target arms. Uh, targeting the shoulder, it's too risky to hit the head, so try not to. Uh, sometimes you get away with it, sometimes you won't. We've got a few minutes of lecture up front, and then we start into the other stuff. Uh, different poles for different roles. Okay, so like a short pole like this, this is uh, really good for if you know you're going to fight in tight, you got a bunch of armor in a battle game, or you just really want to get in. Uh, this might be good actually in a pole tournament, pole on pole, because if I get in, I've got big advantages on the inside. Problem is, is getting in, crossing that distance is hard. Uh, the cores for these are going to be bamboo, 602 kite spar, or carbon fiber, generally. Um, you can go with a stouter core. But generally, these are going to be quicker weapons, and you can get pretty good bamboo 
that's strong enough for something like this length. Then we've got speed poles, which are these bamboo poles. Um, this is a breakdown pole so I can take it on flights. Speed poles, these are gonna be the poles that you use primarily um, if you're planning on fighting by yourself or in small groups, uh, like on a ditch field or in a battle game or something. These are really good for real quick movements, getting in and out, bah, bah, you know. Uh, they're a lot of fun. I really like speed poles. Uh, Rogue Theory states your speed pole should be as tall as you are plus your hand. Right? So that's that's like the old school Rogue Theory. Uh, I generally go with a little longer of a pole. Uh, but in my case, it's about seven feet, which is what this is. Um, then we have medium weight poles, which those are my kind of all around poles. There it is. This is just, uh, oh, speed poles are usually maybe going to be carbon fiber or bamboo. This is a medium weight pole. Um, you're going to use probably good thick bamboo or light pole vaulting core for this kind of stuff. This is my go-to pole for almost everything. If I'm fighting a speed pole, I have more length and I have enough weight and stiffness that I can really manipulate his pole and knock it off line and have the range. And if I'm fighting another, if I'm fighting a war pole, somebody's got a real big heavy pole, this is going to allow me to be faster than it and still have enough strength and rigidity that I can move it. So this is my like all around pole. I also have a hook on this that allows me to manipulate equipment uh, a lot easier. Uh, if I had made it strike legal, I could have chopped shoulders with it, but it's not strike legal. So, <clears throat> um, And then war poles. I don't have a real like big war pole, but those are going to be your like big fiberglass or pole bolt heavy cores that are going to be like 8 to 12 feet long. Anything over that's really unwieldy. Um, I've seen 15 footers. Those only work if you have a pike formation. But yeah, these are going to be used to control the field. You're not going to be quite as easy to snipe shit. Excuse me, snipe stuff good. being filmed. Um, you're not going to be, it's not going to be easy to snipe thing. You're going to be using this to manipulate equipment and just put the fear of God into people. Like, don't hit me with that. Oh, my friend killed you. Right? That's what your big war poles are going to be used for. It's a threat range kind of thing. Uh, do you have anything to add to anything I've said so far? My rule of thumb for length of a pole arm is your height plus two feet. And that's, I mean, that could generally be like your arm. And I just, that's what I like is your height plus two feet. And one of my favorite phrases to tell people when I'm teaching pole is just like he said, a, a war pole, anything greater than eight feet is going to be a weapon primarily of intimidation. You're going to be out there, you're going to be making moves with it, and you're going to be getting people outside of range and controlling the range so that your shieldmen can step up and so that you can push lines. A war pole is going to be a weapon primarily of intimidation. A uh, pole, like a speed pole or his pole that's at a good range for your body size, that's going to be a weapon of murder. That's going to be a weapon you're going to use to kill your opponent. There's basically two grips for poles. You have your shovel grip, palm up, my hand's going to be closed on it. This is a you know, pretty common grip, and we have the ore grip. Go ahead and just grab both grips, kind of walk around a little bit, feel how they feel in your hands, throw some experimental shots, see what you like better. I almost always fight ore grip. I think you fight about 50-50. Yeah. D depending on the situation I find myself in, I'll transition from shovel to ore. Yeah, and be, being good in both, I think, is really important. I've neglected my shovel grip. Do you have a, a preference or a suggestion for the beginning, like which hand you prefer forward? So it depends to an extent on what you're planning on doing. Um, I know people who really like to stab, they really like to harpoon, they like their dominant hand back. So when they get that big extension, they feel they have more control yeah, uh, with their dominant hand. When I'm doing a lot of slashing, I like my dominant hand forward. So uh, it kind of just depends on what you're looking to do. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, one of the nice things though about this hand forward, uh, left hand forward in my case, is if I'm on the line, this is now your sword side, and I can get these big 
hip mm -hmm. assisted swings. My brother's really good at that. He's got a 10 foot pole and he'll be here, he'll be fighting. He'll see somebody and he'll just put his hip into it and sling it out there. He's really good at that. It's a little harder for me to do. If I'm gonna do the same thing, I do it with a shovel scoop mm -hmm. or a, you know, this scoop here. Um, so it just depends on what you're looking to do. I feel better with my right hand forward. I know a lot of people fight opposite. You fight. Same, same methodology, actually. Yeah. I have the same one. If I'm going to be throwing a lot of like outside chops like this, or if I'm going to be throwing some real deep stabs, I want my strong hand. Uh, I want it on the back. That way I get all of that control as I'm throwing my stabs, right? And then if I'm going to be throwing a lot of like real heavy chops, your power is going to come from that because this is where your motor control is right here. This is literally just your lever. So if I'm going to be throwing some heavy chops or if I'm going to be doing some real quick manipulation, uh, I want my, my main hand up front. That way I can get that power into that. So. Cool. We're going to go through our guards really quick. All right. So, um, I'm going to start with the ox. So the ox is going to, uh, and he brought this up, which was really good, keeping this about a fist's length off your hip. That gives you a little bit of wiggle, right? So the ox is going to be here, and then you got your horns. Your horns are the motion. And when I'm in this stance, I'm going to constantly be moving. And I'm going to be targeting and threatening constantly with this, okay? So then, this is the plow. And generally, if I go to plow, I'm gonna go here just because this, this kind of hurts me. Yeah, it's awkward. Here. That's a real awkward way to hold your pole. I guess if you're, if yep, you know, yeah. you're gonna come I've to- I've seen it like where you don't hold it with the back of the palm, like you hold it like pinched, like that, for this. But even in that case, in or, it's just as easy to go like that. Yeah. So I, if you're in plow, I don't see any reason why you should. Plus, if you're in plow holding your sword like, or holding your pole like that, and they press real heavy and you get caught up, that's going to be really yeah. like difficult for you to maneuver out of, and you can hurt your wrist. So again, we've got our ox. We've got the plow, plow, and then we have the murder strike. So this is the roof canted off in either direction, those are your murder strikes. Okay, about 15, 20 degrees off center. When you're holding your roof, you want like, from, you don't want it down here, like at growing level, because that's really hard. You, you want your hand up above your belly button a little bit so that you can get that mo momentum down, so you can get the control down either direction. Because if you're right here, yeah, exactly. You're you're working against yeah. your body, but if you're up here, hand about two hands widths above your belly button, then as you're stepping, you can get a lot of power into that. We're going to start doing some interactive stuff. We're going to I'm going to demonstrate some attack. We're going to demonstrate some attacks really quick, uh, and then we'll just each grab a shield, and you guys can just do it a couple times on the uh, shield. And right now, we're just going to target the shield to so just go flat on this body. Okay. So we're going to do the pool cue. Okay. So with pool cue, I'm just going to aim, I'm just sliding right here like this, okay? If you do it from the shovel, same thing, right? One thing you have to be careful about when you're in shovel is sometimes it's going to want to ride up. So you want to make sure that if you're doing the shovel that it's not riding up. It's a little easier. In my opinion, to keep the tip down in or just because your hand's kind of pressing down just naturally. So we're just going to do like ten, uh, 10 in each stance. Boom, 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 boom. Do 10 in each stance from both the or and the shovel. There you go. Now switch. There you go. Yeah, just ten inches. Two, three, four. Don't be afraid to experiment with pressure a little bit. Throw a little heat on it. So I'm gonna come up. You're getting a kill with it. To the roof. Exposing yourself. Boom, boom. Right here. Come up. Got a great To the roof. Tick tock. Boom. The hope is that when you do this, you bring it up, boom, boom, that you're hitting 
that elbow. Right? Because if you try to hit the shoulder in the A-frame, now you've just given them that line. And I'm going to be moving back when I do it. So, roof, boom, boom. And that's going to allow me also, if I miss, possibly to clear and stab it. Okay? All right, here. Take it slow. We'll do the first part of the motion first. Okay. Uh, okay, so go up to your roof. Right there. Just like that. All right, now 2 o'clock. Now 10 o'clock. Now straight down onto the elbow. Perfect. All right. Yep. Circle down to your roof. Then two down. All right. Where you're supposed to hit? Close enough. Oh! And that'll happen, right? And that's fun. That's just good fun for everybody. <laughs> Hitting the pommel. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Same kind of thing. We're working in a circle. I'm fighting and I'm going to slash towards the leg. If I hit the leg, great. Like, awesome. I love hitting the leg. I'm going to step back into the right a little bit. Okay, I hit the leg. This time I'm going to miss the leg. All right, so I'm going to throw, miss, scoop. Okay, or you can slash, scoop. Either one are valid. This one's a little bit more friendly. And the nice thing about stepping back into the right with it is he's going to want to rush me right so like oh i got that and i'm up in uh, a good block and if i miss it and he goes for it now he can't hit me because i took his arm right and if you rotate out towards your opponent's shield size you're doubling the distance between mm -hmm. their their threat and you so like right here if he stays straight and he throws that i can hit him but if he rotates out I now have to either turn my body or I can't hit him at all. So we're going to do this shot with a step. I'm going to throw this shot to the leg, miss it, step, and I'm going to bring this in. I'm aiming for the armpit elbow area. Okay? Tasty bit. My favorite thing to do with this shot, really, is hit the pommel and just pop their sword out of their hand. That's my favorite thing. Even if I die immediately after, I'm okay with that. You don't have to just try to apply this if you miss the leg. Yep. Like he said, if he takes that step in and I hit that leg, right? I can hit that leg and drag through and get the kill. Yep. Like you don't have to use it specifically as a bait or as a, oh man, I missed that leg. If I get that leg, just carry it through. Carry and it through and now I've got the kill. So you can also apply it. Like, don't think... I missed the leg, yeah. I have to do a shovel scoop. You can also think, oh, I got that leg and my sword's over here, or my pole's over here now. Carry now through. I can do a shovel scoop. Yep. Think about it as a auxiliary if you miss and as a follow-up if you hit. Yep. It's just, it's the, for me, it's the second thing I do in that motion. Yes. So you're going to trace the edge of the shield side, to hit that leg. Use this hand as a yep. fulcrum. Yeah, 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 that's, so you're not going to be doing a shovel squeeze because of your like stance. That. Okay. But that's okay. That shot's still yeah, good. But it's not going to be a shovel scoop. It's so something different. what should I do with this, correct? So, yeah, you, to do it as a shovel scoop, you do it like that. Like Slash that? it, boom. You're going to need a good grip on it because you're going to pull in. You're going to throw, like, try to pull that. This way? No, no, don't sit back. Oh, Just sorry. Pull that. Pull. So it goes. So it goes. That's like the power you're going to put in. Okay. Still, yeah. from that point. So you go. Oh, yeah. Good. What I like to do is I'll throw a slot, like, I'll slow, throw a slot as a bait or as a feint into a second slot. Like, if he's got this, like, a little bit of a spot right here like if he's really choking up and I just can't quite get in there I'll throw like this and throw that same slot hoping that he'll bring it up and then when he does throw another one just poof, oh, okay duck my body a little bit be like or use a slot as an opener to a um, to a stab like slot stab and then you can also do a little bit of weapon manipulation 
he's got his little A-frame right there, right? I can just be like... Oh yeah, just peel it open. Yeah, like if he's if he's not resting it on his head and he's got it more like a, uh, like that, yeah, I'm just be like... Do you guys see what he did? Yeah. He just, we're holding this here, and he just tipped, opened the tip, and then chopped the arm. Pop, pop, yeah. Somebody up like this. Uh, uh, for instance, for uh, on the uh, we're on the field. I see a guy in my periphery. I'm fighting. He's off here, and I'm just going to throw my hip into it and use my hip as a fulcrum. Boom! Oh, a little short. Right. Boom! Right there. I get pretty good power, and I can recover. Okay, so we're not going to be directly in front of each other. I'm fighting somebody. Boom. Okay. If I were this way, it would be. I'll come here. over this side. So we're fighting. We're fighting on the line. We're fighting on the line. Hit. Boom. And I'll do this too um, if I'm hurt. Yes. Like all this, like body. <laughs> all this body manipulation. You want you right here, and let's say you're over here where the camera is, right? and I'm facing this direction fighting somebody. I can be right here and use my hip as the fulcrum. Boom. Right? So. When, when I make my fake, you go take that shot. And we'll do pull stab. Okay. And I'll right stand here. right here. Perfect. Now you use your hip, drop back, just like that. Yep. So this came up kind of uh, a little bit organically. We had some cool. Uh, we had some cool interactions, but the pull stab is a really good pull on pole or pull on board. So I'm coming up to the roof. I'm throwing a chop, okay. and I'm expecting him to block hard because he doesn't want me to power through. So he's blocked hard. I'm choking up, stabbing. Right? I can also pull this short as I'm going. So. Right? I don't need to finish this chop. I just need him to believe that the chop's coming. So I come up to the roof, chop, stab. Chop, stab. Okay? And then if he has a board, and I've hit his shoulder a bunch, I've punished his shoulder so it starts coming high. Right? I've punished the shoulder and it comes up like that. That'll happen. So you'll... Same thing. And it does work particularly well if you have punished their shoulder. Yeah. If you've gotten a good murder strike on somebody, <laughs> the first thing they're going to do when that arm, when that pole comes up is table that shield. Yep. Because they're not going to want it to happen again. Right. So we'll do uh, a few more, a few of those, and then we're going to start into evasion, which is going to be a little more footwork stuff. So you're going to go up to roof, right? 15 degrees, yeah. and then you're going to murder strike. All right, I'm going to counter match you. So when I go to block, all right, I'm going to step to block. You're going to come just short, or you're going to make contact. If you make contact, slide your hand and do the stab. All right, ready? Go. Good. And you don't have to take that step forward. So you just went like this, and then took another like step forward and brought your feet parallel to stab. You can literally just from there, and then pull. Key. Yeah. All right. Okay, now, pull it short and tender. Okay. Perfect. Well, you didn't really slash it. Like, bring it up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you you want to be moving that foot backwards as you're doing your murder strike, right? So so if you're like this, right, you want to be bam, right? Because it will one, if you are murder striking with a purpose, it'll give you that power. And if you're murder striking as part of that bait for that stab, then you're already low enough that you can choke and then stab. You got it. Sorry. Yep. Yep. Throw that. Throw that foot back as you're murder striking, just like that. Perfect. Just like that. One of my favorite. One of my favorite counters to a murder strike is if you notice that your opponent is using a lot of murder strikes or if they're fighting from the roof a lot, what you can do is you can counter them with the ox. And if he's going to throw a murder strike, like I just know it, right? He's going to throw that murder strike. I'm going to go from the ox. I'm going to use this as a pivot point and throw a stab 
as I'm throwing my hand up. So I'm blocking his murder strike as I'm getting that stab. Right? So if he's if he goes to the roof, right? I'm like, oh man, okay. Throw that low stab as you're bringing that hand up. Right? So this will be your fulcrum right here. Literally, all you have to do is from your ox, fist fist away from your hip, right? All you have to do is leave this hand here and just raise this up, right? So as you're as he's coming in, bring this hand up, and that's all you have to do. That's the only motion that you're taking with your actual pole arm. All the rest is in that step. So as he's throwing that murder strike, take that step into that stab and then bring that back hand up. And you get an automatic block for the only shot he's throwing, and you get the stab for the kill. That also leads into if he wants to get real real cheeky with it, and I throw here, and he wants to right then you can just bring that hand back down into that block right so like if a i take wiper. murder chop like if i bring yeah. up the murder chop and he goes right all i had to do was bring it down into a neutral position i didn't bring it all the way down and i still got the block yep yes does uh so i'm left forward so if i go i notice you're both right forward for that okay one. i don't think that matters for yeah this one. No, no, no. okay yeah so yeah. if if he's got his blade on this side, I want my blade down here, and then, right, because he's going to throw that murder strike. But if I, you were right hand, if you were mixed hand, so mixed hand. Are, go right foot forward. Okay. Right. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay. Forward. So, I think it works better. I think it works okay too. Okay. Um, there's a, a little bit of a chance that he can still, but at that point you're just getting a simo, which yeah, I mean it's better than losing. So still just a. Okay. But yeah, if you can, if you can get into the position to where you are hand countering your opponent, like you want, you want to maintain the inside lane. So as he's throwing that, right, you can throw just like that. All right, let's do that. I'll go up to roof, and I want you to go into ox, just like that. That's plow. Go to ox. Right now, as I throw this, you want to bring your back hand up. That's it. Back, back hand up, and you want to take a step and put the tip of that into my stomach. Ready? Now, as as all one fluid motion. So, okay. Before I throw a shot, without moving your tip, bring your hand up to your head. That's how you want it. All right now, bring your hand down. Bring your hand up. Bring your hand down. Bring your hand up. That's the only motion that you need. All right now, bring your hand up. Take a step I would, forward. I would work on no, with your front foot. There's your stab right there. Right, so leave your back foot planted. Go back up one step. With both feet. All right. Now bring your hand up. Take a step forward only with your front foot. There's your stab. All right, and your block because now you're above. All right. So if I'm right here. And I'm gonna throw a murder strike. Now throw, he just me throw that, that entire combination. Class. Ready? Yeah. Perfect. Same thing on this side. Throw that combination. Is there anything you right? I'm scarred, and then I'm here. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That seems perfectly reasonable. Let's try. Yeah. If they're charging, boom. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That would yeah. work too. That works great. So I miss the stab, but I get the block. Right? You can bring your hand forward. And cross body. And you can step like that. too. Yeah. So we're gonna do a drill that I like to call the two-step. The reason I call it the two-step, uh, grab sword and board, is I'm gonna take two steps back, and then I'm immediately cutting a hard angle. Um, I teach this in kickboxing and MMA, uh, and I teach this in any pressure fighting class uh, to counter it. But for pull, it's incredibly important because we cannot allow them to get to the point where they're in my face right like all the cool stuff we can do climbing the pole and stuff they still have the advantage if they're in my face so I'm going to initiate my uh, partner by touching their shield one way or the other and then he's gonna rush me I'm gonna take more than two no more than two steps back before I start cutting a hard angle away from their sword. If he's a lefty, I'm going to cut that way. If he's a righty, I'm going to cut that way. And we'll do both. Yep. Think about it as cutting an L. You want yep. to, one, 
two, and then make your L. Yep, you're gonna move hard on an eight. So we're here, boom. See how I'm circling? And then I'm gonna start scooping the arm. But uh, for the first part, I just wanted to show the movement. All right, we'll go half live, okay? All right, I'm moving that circle, and now he's not making any more distance on me, and he's right there for that, uh, for the strikes. And if you keep your circle tight enough, a shield person is never going to be able to pivot on their foot. You want to try and get them flat-footed, because they'll never be able to pivot faster than you can move laterally. So if you can force the shield men to do this, they're never going to be able to move faster than you can laterally move. So the, the secret for the shield men to actually uh, counter this is for them to move laterally. Yeah. So if I trigger and he starts coming and he sees this, he, well, he's going to move that way to cut me off. Right? Like, he's still trying to close the distance. So he's going to move in front of where I'm moving. So I trigger, then, right, see? Now he closed the distance because he saw me immediately move into my lateral movement. It's the same in boxing or anything. You move in front of where your opponent's moving to, and you close distance. Um, but that's, we're not gonna deal with that. Um, but so, just last, last time, boom, step, step, and I'm moving and I'm scooping. You can hit legs, you can hit arms, you can hit body, anything to keep him from hitting me, that's what I wanna hit, okay? <laughs> all right, yeah. now I'm gonna I'm gonna come a little spicy and try and block and stuff. All right, okay, cool. back. <laughs> yeah, you also you also started to go straight back, which yep. gave me the advantage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My first one was a block, and then you started shovel scooping, mm -hmm. and yeah, you got the elbow. Yeah. Yeah. But also, that shovel scoop adds a little bit of rack. So your first one was flat, and all I had to do was put my sword. But then you shovel scooped the second one, and it came around my block onto my elbow. How'd that feel? Great. It's good. It's a lot. He was noticing um, when he was left-handed forward, it was hard to get any wraps. And the reason for the camera and for you, <clears throat> the reason it's hard to get wraps um, left-handed forward on a right-handed border is because in order to get that kind of English, I have to I have to get my pole past my body. Meanwhile, if I'm fighting here, see how much more of an angle I can get on that without having to do like weird stuff? Yeah, if you do find yourself left, left foot forward and you find a, a shieldman charging you out of nowhere, you can still rotate out to that side. Go yep. ahead and charge me. And if you throw to that hand, that hand is going to push down it. onto that hand or onto that leg. So you're getting their sword into a position to where they can't throw a shot, and then you're clipping their mobility all while you're moving away. So go ahead and at speed, come at me. Run him down! Okay. Get him! See, even I didn't rotate out that much, but nope. and which is why you caught me. But the premise is accurate. If you throw that towards that hand, you can clip that leg as you're rotating out. Now, optimal, you're going to want that shovel scoop like that. Yeah! Like that. See? But you're going to want that shovel scoop so that you can get all up on the inside of their shield. But if they charge you and you're fighting somebody else and unprepared, that is a good premise is rotate out and chop for that hand. See if you can disarm them and clip the leg. At the very least, see if you can stop them from throwing a shot while they charge and clip the leg. So now we're going to talk about the spin out. Um, and this, uh, I like the spin out for a couple things. Primarily, I use it for if I overextend or lose control of my pole. Okay? If I stab and he knocks it offline and I lose control of my pole, it's slower to try to regather it than it is to spin out because I'm making distance, my pole's still behind me, so he can't just, he can't just charge because he might get caught up on the pole or something. So if I stab and miss, or say uh, I'm on a line 
and I'm really trying to get a deep stab on somebody and I'm lunging on it and I stab. My recovery is so slow that the only answer is to spin out or hope that my homies can save me when I step beyond the line, right? So that spin out is going to be stab and then I'm going to curl and step away. Okay, um, you can also do this uh, off like a two-handed stab, boom, to clear the distance, but generally I do this to pull myself back behind my line or against another pole. I'm trying to get a good range stab on another pole and he goes to knock it offline. Oh, no, 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 I don't, I don't want any of that mess, right? Yeah, so go ahead and throw that stab and I'll knock it offline. Now, as he goes to spin, that's he's got that block. That's why you do that. Is because if he goes to throw that stab and I knock it offline, and I try if to he recover. doesn't spin, I can literally just chop him. But if he spins, yeah, you're doubling your distance away from your opponent very quickly and you're putting something between the two of them, yep. which is optimal. Yep, so let's just do a few of those. Um, these are fun. Like if you get the if you get the stab, you get that kill, and you spin out. You just feel good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So if you go to stab, I'm here. Let, let go. I knock you, you off. Really? Yeah. Perfect. And then. Yeah. Like that. Okay, I'm gonna go other hand. Try right other hand. Yeah. Good. Cool. We'll do two more. Yeah. Boom! I've knocked it offline. I'm coming for you now. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a sword and border who's sitting here completely unprepared, you just take that step and throw for that shoulder, boop, All right? Spin up and around, and then you've taken that out and removed uh, and doubled the distance between his buddies and you. This is uh, something that I could have showed at any point uh, in this evasion stuff, or you know, we could have added it in somewhere on the strikes, because climbing the pool is important for offensive work too. But one of the most important things I've started doing, uh, whether it comes to fighting against sword and board or other poles, is when we start closing the distance, there's no reason that I have to fight all the way down here. If he starts pushing in on me, I can clo close in. And now, because I'm closer to the tip of my weapon, I have more leverage. I have this other end, right, that we can do stuff with. Um, there's a ton of stuff that we can do, and then I can come through, right, and get in with, so I've got a shorter a shorter lever at this point. So where I usually uh, show people how to do this, and it's probably something that I need to work on, is I usually just do the two-step again, where if he picks up his board, and he starts coming at me, I'm going to let him get a little closer, and then fight here, or chop here, right? So he comes in, triggers. Oh, that's one thing you got to worry about. Yeah, your pull's longer on the other end. But we just get in, and then we get into that grind. And I'm moving across the angle, but I'm also much shorter because now he can't hit me in the leg. This whole side over here is blocked, right? And if you can get your opponent, come over here so that the cameras can see you. If you can get your opponent to throw cross body shots like that, you can literally just chop that arm straight down. Yep. Especially when you're if close. you're choked up and I rush him and I'm like this, then it's way easier. Just straight down. And if they do throw a high cross, right, you nothing says you can't come and start coming over here. It's probably like real advanced to go, okay, we're choked up, he high crosses, and then I start stepping this way, right? That's probably way more advanced than we should be talking about. And then uh, another thing, just about choking up, getting tight. Remember, if uh, if we get in and we get in tight, both ends of these poles can be used for manipulation, right? Also, I'm not touching his blade. There's nothing that says, as long as I don't grab it, that I can't manipulate his weapon with my other hand. Okay. As um, long as you're not touching the blade area of it, 
and you're not grabbing it, you can manipulate yep. other people's equipment. Yeah, so uh, that's just stuff that you can play with with other people who like pole work. I don't think we're going to do any specific drills on that. Let's do like three or four minutes. Why don't you guys just match up, start, pull the pole, and just don't be super competitive about it. Feel it out. Feel what you think, and if you got any questions, you know, let us know, and we'll uh, we'll we'll, uh, we'll watch and give uh, feedback. <laughs> oh. Oh. So right there, go ahead and pause. One thing that I noticed, uh, go ahead and reset into that position. Okay, now you brought your pole over and brought his pole down to your side. All right, you had him like this. All right, so you went something similar to like this. Yeah. Right. You brought his pole onto the inside. Yeah. Right. Which he should have killed. He should have. He should have just chopped you. Yeah. yeah. So you have to be really aware of the tip orientation and the blade orientation of your opponent's pole if you're going to start rubbing around and grinding like that. Okay. Yeah, you did, did it again. again. Did yeah, it again. Just, yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. There you go, there you go, yeah. So when you did that, when you did that chop that you did, bring your hands together. Yeah, they're really wide right now, okay. This whole getting in close. Also, if you're if you're new to an area and you see somebody using a pole arm, I don't recommend your first meeting with them being like, yeah, don't make sure you like it. Make sure yeah. that they're cool with it first because a lot of people don't want to get that close. They're going to feel real pressured and intimidated and they're going to want to stay at close range. So make sure you get to know somebody and their fighting style and their preferences before you get in you there start and you're like Kirk and Spock. Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> you don't you definitely don't want your opponent to feel intimidated or like you're trying to physically hurt them. Right. So that's not a first interaction that you yeah. want to have. Also, if you are in a in a ditch situation or a battle game in your main pole, have a belt knife, have a yeah. dagger, have something. If we get in tight here, well, you know, it, it's a lot of fun to just shank somebody. <laughs> or a situation that we found ourselves in in the last class, if you find yourself wounded all of a sudden, but yeah. you're in very close, you can literally just be like, toss it to the side, knife out, stab. Then a lot of times what you can do is if you catch that first one, go ahead and mirror me. Now if I bring it up and I catch that first one, immediately just tilt into that second one because they're going to be thinking about moving that arm away from their pole. So if you do get them to mirror you like that and you get that first shot, you can immediately just drop into a second shot if you catch it. If not, you need to spin out or like find a way to create distance so that you're not getting hit by their return. But if you do catch that arm, it's a good idea to have a follow-up in line. Yeah, you might as well get the kill at that yeah. point. Sort of like here. So right here, yeah. You, you catch it immediately like that because my first thought is going to be taking the wound. Yeah. So shield on shield, a lot of what you're going to want to do is if you have guys who are working shields next to each other, like if they're in a shield wall and let's say they're overlapping shields, you're going to want to get to the point to where you are opposite yeah. of their shield overlap, okay? Because yeah. as I throw my stab, his shield pressure is going to throw it into your body. Same difference, overlap the other direction. If I'm over here and we're fighting in a team or on a ditch and I see y'all doing that, I can literally just like, yep. and see, I threw a stab right here, but because the shield is in, it pushed my sword, or it pushed the tip of my pole into his body. So you can keep, or stay mindful of all of those things as you're working on a battlefield look at the orientation of people's shields and stuff like that and like especially if you have two teams even if they're not overlapping you can throw shots at somebody's shield right like that mm -hmm. he doesn't directly perceive me as a threat because i'm throwing at your shield right but then if i take that step so you can definitely like if you're fighting as part of a team or in a battlefield or on a ditch Look at how people's shields are oriented. Look at how they're working together as a unit and start manipulating their equipment to your advantage. Start prodding into shields and stuff like that, right? Because even if y'all aren't overlapped, if you go to resist my shot, go ahead and push against me, right? Yeah. 
you pushing just put the tip of my pole into his body because your reaction was i don't want that now you just put your friend like i just got a kill because you me stabbing right here you pushed my pole into his body yeah and even if i hit hit like i'm hitting his shield right i love that fake i'm still hitting his shield now i'm distracting him and the pole three people down can now stab him oh, yeah so you can definitely work together if i'm stabbing you and you push it into his shield now so you can definitely work in tandem with another pole or with a shield. He mentioned in uh, the last class that we did together, if he and I were to go out onto a ditch field and one of us cho chose to be a shield and one of us chose to be a pole, we would be very difficult to kill together because you need to have, um, in that kind of situation, you need to know how to work together with a pole, with a shield, and against a pole and a shield. Speaking of, since we're on the topic, yeah. if you and I are working together and I'm your swordman, I don't want to be back here with him because yeah. now, now I'm not protecting him. I want to be up right at the blade of his weapon, right? I want his threat right here and then he can extend past. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm protecting him. Any further back, if I have to back up, I risk running into him. And any further forward, he's not enough of a threat to keep me safe. Right, so that blade is basically where I'm looking to be on most poles. And that that actually that reminds me of a cheeky little thing. He likes to do that little arm snipe thing. I have something I, I like to do when I'm working with a. If you have any way to coordinate similar colors to your blade and your sword, when he when we're sitting here like this, if he goes like he's gonna throw a dark side, and then I just slot. You're looking at his. You're looking at this. Like yeah. this is his sword. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So yeah, if you like, if you're fighting with your fighting company and you can coordinate the blade colors of poles and swords, you can literally, with a sword and a board and a pole behind it, you can have the pole hidden back here like this. And then when he throws that dark side, you can come out and the person who was directly in front of him is like, oh, why is his sword eight feet long now? Yeah. <laughs> dirty, um, dirty stuff that you can do with a pole. The reason I put that hook on there is for equipment manipulation. He can hook my pommel, my shield, whatever. Like he can pull that out of my hand right now, right? Um, one of my favorite things to do with this, especially if somebody's armed, is they're down here, they're in their A-frame, you just hook that hook on their sword and pull, and then your friends can come kill, you can kill. Anything you can do that's legal, that puts a, uh, an extra flange on your weapon, it's fun. I really want to make a pole with a hook on it, but that's a spear, because that's a little too long to like peel my shield open and get a stab. It's too long, but like a six to eight inch spear tip, I think it'd be real fun. Um, anytime you can manipulate on a team, it's gonna it's gonna help a lot. I generally like to use heavier poles if I'm gonna be doing stop thrusts, and so I don't do a ton of them. Uh, partially because they're rude, so if you miss the shield, uh, people don't get aren't very happy about it. And we do them slightly differently. Um, I we both aim for the hip. For this hinge, right? Uh, so about solar plexus to hip is where I'm aiming generally. And I'm going to aim at his shield, but he's going to start wanting to rush me, and I'm going to step and stop him, right? He don't get to go forward because he can't go through my pole. Yeah. Right. Um, your uh, your feet don't want to move if your hips aren't following them. Yeah. So if I if I hit him hard enough to hinge him at the hips, right? He's got to readjust his stance to keep moving, and that hopefully will give me enough time to skip out and let my buddies take care of him, or rush forward and kill him, depending. Uh, in battle games, if somebody's got a bunch of armor on their chest and they're coming running through your your di your bridge or your castle gate or whatever, you can do the same thing and just pin them in place and let your buddies kill them. This is more about just stopping him and making him think twice about rushing me. And then uh, the other thing that uh, Xander was doing was he was doing it more, I'm not really looking, I see this guy wanting to come at me and I'm trying to, I, I hit him in the hip, which is better than the yeah. shield, but he's gonna use this to stop him from coming at me and I'm gonna fade back just a little bit to give me a little bit more space to then reacquire my target because I'm fighting multiple people. Um, 
then we can do a little bit of practice of both of these. So you're going to do the two-handed thrust. You can do either or or shovel, but I'm going to just take a step forward with it, and then boom. All right, I'm really trying to push him with this. And not fast. And the reason why we say throw for the uh, solar plexus, the hip area, is not only is that your center of gravity for most people, your feet don't want to move if your hips aren't following, yep. right? Also, if you aim for the upper quadrant of someone's shield, and they, yeah, you can hit somebody's shield into their throat, you can hit it into their shin, or you can run up their shield and break their nose, or you can miss, like if he throws to the upper quadrant here and misses, he's in on me. Yeah. So you want to throw right there at their center of gravity because that's where they're most likely to stop. To stick them. Yeah. So, two versions. I'm going to do the two-handed stop thrust, or I'm fighting here on an angle. I see him starting to come, and I'm just going to touch it and try to get him to think twice about running on yeah. me because I saw him. I saw him. I interrupted him. I jolted him. So, have you all ever heard of a fight computer? Have y'all ever heard the terminology fight computer? The terminology, sure. So the terminology fight computer is everybody has a plan. Mike Tyson's famous for saying everyone's got a plan until they get hit, right? So if I'm <laughs> over here and he's got a pole and I'm like, oh man, he doesn't see me, and I start to move in, my plan is to charge him and kill him. The second I get hit and stopped dead in my tracks, plan changes. Yeah, so that's a, that's a, that same concept is also known as the OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, act. And so. If you can interrupt any one of those, it resets their OODA loop and they have to re-establish their plan. Yes. It's, it's generally the same concept uh, that they teach in the military for like uh, defensive and offensive shooting practices. Like you acknowledge your threat, orient yourself, decide to act, act. So if he's facing the camera as an opponent, he observes that I am a threat, orients himself to the threat, decides to act, acts right that is the process by which you want to do that now i went through a similar process i observed that he wasn't paying attention to me i oriented myself to him i decided to act and i act he he's interrupt interrupting that and now my thought process has to reset his doesn't because he's now already in the middle of the action portion of that i've got the initiative with that yes yeah well, makes yeah. sense yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So let's do a couple of those. So I want you to two-hand stab me as hard as you can right here. Right? I'm going to take a couple of steps for you, or forward, and I just want you to stop me. All right? That's not hard enough. Okay. So this two-handed stab That's is going good. to be something you're going to use a stouter pole for. Yeah. So just be aware. Do you, I was watching you, and I noticed when you took a step, you kind of I stepped like almost into a horse stance. Yeah, and you have that lower center of gravity yeah. and you have all your... And that's specifically because I'm looking to push and be strong this way. Yeah. If somebody were to push me from this direction, I'd be real weak. But this way, that's super strong. But I'm not, I never fight there. Yeah. I get into it and then I'm back into a good stance. Okay. Yeah, you want to lunge into a point of stability. Yeah. Ready? That was a little high. You pushed my shield into my chin. Down here, like lower quadrant, hips area. So that was a little off to the side. Mm -hmm. And had I wanted to press, I could have just press. You want to like really stick that. Aim like this center little piece right here that you can see. Aim for the lower part of that and really hit it like it owes you money. Yeah, you want to aim more towards sword side because yeah. if if you're going to slide off, you want to slide, slide off into, onto yeah. that sword side. So, okay. All right, let's do a little off-center stuff. So you guys are fighting on the line. I'm gonna. Uh, yeah. If you uh, face the camera like it was your opponent, mm -hmm. I'm gonna come from right here. All right. You don't even have to turn to face me very much. Mm -hmm. Literally just boom, just a little bit. It's, it's weird, right? Because you're not targeting with both eyes, so you're just kind of like instinctually doing it. Okay. Are uh, you guys got any questions before we before I go into any other stuff? Uh, I had two. One, okay. they're super basic. I like questions. Um, 
do you take when you do like a lot of your testing shots i notice and a lot of like boom back up do you take notice of how the shield itself fulcrums based yes. on like either a punch or a strap yes. or, okay yeah especially especially if i'm team fighting if i if i don't know if it's a if it's a strap or a punch i'm going to aim and i'll probably aim to the sword side and try to hit that corner because it looks and it could be a legit shot. Like if I fold that sword to yeah. the sword side. Armpit. Right? Yeah. It's going to come armpit, shoulder. Um, so I will take those testing shots on the edge of equipment. And also like some shields, this is super light. If he chops the edge of my shield, he's going to notice that this shield is light. Yeah. And he's just going to be able to push this to the side. Right? So you'll do testing shots on equipment, especially people you don't know. Be like, okay, their shield's like this. With this shield, I have to block with my hand. This is not this is not a shield that I can rely on the rim of the shield to defend a pole. Even that teaches you something because you know at that point that if he has to block with that, he can fake over. Yeah, if I go right, if I have to move my shield because it's a super light shield and I have to block with the hand, that gives him information to then feint. Right? Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, this goes on like pole v pole. Uh -huh. um, is it better, do you find it better to hand match or do you find like a stance specific or is it just like person to person? What would be like your first like mindset? I do not flow between stances a ton. Um, I don't, and it's, this might be because in the Pacific Northwest there's not a lot of really good pole fighters. Um, most of the time I can just be in my normal stance and win regardless of what they're doing. But I prefer hand matched because hand matched gives me that shot on the elbow and that gets me, that nets me so many easy kills after I've wounded them that like, that's my main thing. I'm like, are you going to, oh, you're going to let me do it. Okay. The fight's mine. If they've fought me enough and they don't know, or if they fought me enough and they know that now, well then the fight gets more interesting and that's great. What about you? Do you... Uh, I like to start um, in ox and just kind of prod at my opponent and see yep. what they're going to do and see if I can like work them into a situation to where I can be like and force a hesitation because I know that if I go like this, yeah, they're going to, if I do that two or three times and I get that kill, the second I go, they're going to do that. So I, I like to force hesitation with my opponent and I'll almost always start in ox and try to like work my way into a, a kill or an advantage and then once they have that in their mind that when I do that mm -hmm. they need to do this well then when I do that I'm gonna do something else yeah um, I would agree almost any especially anybody I don't know I'm gonna start an ox because that puts the most distance between me and my opponent and my weapon between me and my opponent so I get an idea to gauge foot speed I get an idea to gauge their angles I get an idea on uh, what feints they're gonna bane on, all while keeping my weapon between me and my opponent. And you can change, you can change the direction of the tip as well as the distance of the tip from your opponent. Mm -hmm. If you're constantly doing stuff like this, but you're not changing the direction or the, oh, the distance, distance of the tip, then they know that anything you're doing right here isn't a threat. You're just keeping them at this range. Yeah. But if you're like. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, the second your pole's over here, they're like, oh, no. And then you move back, and you're like, mm -hmm. 